Hello. In the third and final video of the time series module, I'll be going over how to run the uh, models that I previously explained in Python. So to begin, I'll be loading in these libraries. And these are common libraries used in data science. Then I'll be loading in the data set. So I have avocado, flight, US gas price, and then San Francisco vehicle theft um, data sets. And I'm loading them in here. And you can time to find the sources. Um, and cleaning up the data. So this is an important part when you're doing time series. Um, the most important thing here is that I'm setting the date time column to a date time object that's important um, so you can group it and you can do various functions on date time objects it might be reading in these date objects as like a string so that won't be good and won't have the properties we want to work with the time series with um, and then the other part here of setting the frequency so the basically pandas will read in the data frame and then it will infer what frequency the data is but you can actually explicitly input it. So if, if it has like an NA value or some gaps in it, then it will destroy the pattern and it won't be able to infer it correctly. You can actually in, you can actually input it in explicitly. So that's what I'm doing here. So we have a, a monthly data set here. We have a weekly, uh, week starts on Monday, the week starts on, a week starts on Sunday, the week starts on Monday. So that's something you can play around with, but it's an important part of the pre-processing step of working with time series data. So here I'm gonna just display the data set really quickly so you can take a peek at it. Um, for example, the time series data set for gas prices at the, at the weekly level. Um, the, avocado, the flight set is at the monthly level here. And then the avocado sales is at the weekly and then so on. And then, so um, one thing is important to do is kind of feel what the data looks like. So before you begin doing anything with the data set, you should graph it out visually. So these are graphs that I showed in the previous video, but you can take a look at them again, how I generated it. So this is our no seasonality and week trend. We have seasonality and trend here. Um, this is seasonality trend, and we have the holiday spikes in avocado sales, and this is we have the, the changing trend over time. So this is when I'll begin to talk about the various models and how to run them. So first of all, we'll be talking about the no seasonality and the weak trend models. And for those, you would want to use something like simple exponential smoothing. Simple exponential smoothing is, as I previously mentioned, there's only one parameter you can control for the smoothing level. And as a quick summary, this controls how responsive the forecast is. So a low value, I mean a high value closer to for example one would make this forecast very responsive and the forecast that we predict would be very similar to the most recently seen value. So for example here we have, um, I have basically put an, uh, basically called the library here and I built the model, putting it on the gas prices data set. Then I'm passing in here our smoothing level or our parameter. Um, you can let the library choose one for you or you can actually explicitly pass it in. So I'm doing all three here, and then you can predict 100 time steps into the future, and you can plot the results. So for example, um, you see here that I'm basically using, letting the model recommend one for the blue line, which is basically predicting um, the last line we saw. And then it's, so it's a very responsive model. And then if I use 0.5, it's also a very responsive model. So it's basically predicting something that's very similar to the last observation, which we had this in 2020 here. Um, if I use a low alpha, low alpha here, like such as 0.001, I'm saying that don't be responsive. So look at the previous data more, look at historical data more. So that's why in the alpha is low, we see that the forecast, which is the orange line here, is similar to stuff we saw or values we saw in a very, very long time ago. So the idea is here, low alpha means that we're using the past data more. So we're using this past data a lot more. And that's what's in the larger weight in the data in our final forecast. So that's um, the intuition behind how you can control the parameters in simple exponential smoothing. Also, when you have a weak trend, and no seasonality, you can use something called the REMA. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a P, D, and Q terms. Um, the P is the odd regressive order, the D is the differencing, and then Q is the moving average order. Um, and these, these, are, so be, these are basically our three parameters. You pass them in when you're initiating the REMA model here. So order is one, one, one. That's being passed in here. And then you can fit and you can forecast. So as you can see here, the forecast is straightforward and it basically kind of extrapolates what the trend is and predicts the trend. Again, the, the, it's not really seasonality, so it's kind of ignoring all these up and down peaks and just kind of saying what is the long-term growth in this, and that's where we get this red line here. Um, the next case is the seasonality and trend, and for most time series data sets you work with, this is the case you'll find some seasonality and some trend. Um, there's two types of trend and two types of seasonality, multiplicative and additive, and I'll be going over um, these types shortly. There's some code here that generates this graph, but you don't need to look at it too carefully. The idea here is that trend is two types, multiplicative and additive. The trend, um, if it's multiplicative, is kind of increasing kind of in this curve pattern over time, whereas additive tends to be more linear. 
either it's seasonality, there's also multiplicative and then additive. For multiplicative seasonality, this jagged seasonality is kind of increasing over time. So you know, the peaks are lower and they get bigger over time. For additive, the peaks stay pretty much the same, right? You see this kind of jagged pattern, but the jagged peaks are consistent. So um, that's the, the major types of trend in seasonality. And then uh, we will explain how to build models all these shortly. Um, so first of all, the triple exponential smoothing model, also known as Holt Winters. Um, it, it's, it's very similar to the, the simple exponential smoothing model we showed except that we have more parameters to control. So we, before only, oops, um, before, before we only had the uh, smoothing level, now we have the smoothing slope and the smoothing seasonal. And these parameters are again, um, something between zero and one that controls how responsive the forecast is. So a higher value, of course, means we're gonna be closer and more responsive to the more recent observed values, whereas a lower value is gonna mean we are closer and our forecast is gonna depend more on historical or older values that we saw. And of course, you should specify whether the thing is added, whether the trend or slope, whether the trend or um, seasonality is added or multiplicative. So that's what these are controlling here. So um, to walk you through very quickly, you, you initiate the model here, initialize the model, you pass in the data you want to train on, um, the type of trend is seasonality, and then the seasonal period. So this data set is monthly, so it's 12. Then you're going to go through and fit the model. So you can let the model choose the parameters again. If you set optimize equals true, or you can explicitly set the values. So I'm um, explicitly setting very low values here, and then you can also um, set higher values such as 0.4. Then uh, you can predict on it, or you can fit and you can forecast on it. And then I'm graphing it here. One thing to note here is that um, you know, for as I as I vary the value between 0.001 and 4, you don't see a big change. That's because the pattern is pretty consistent here. So you know, it's 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 not consistent from the peak of the height, but the multiplicative it's growing at like a constant multiplicative rate. And that's why if we look at the past, we look at more recent data, that the multiplicative pattern is kind of similar. So it's going to not vary too much. And we can use this, you know, any value we use for gamma and alpha does not have a big change in what our forecast actually is. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the uh, triple exponential smoothing model. The next one is the SREMA. So this is the natural, ex natural extension to the ARIMA model, but for seasonality. Again, we have the same P, D, and Q terms here. We add another set called the another set of parameters called the seasonal order, which is very similar. It has a P, a D, and a Q, and these are these are basically this very similar terms. They do the same thing except they count they account for the seasonal part. And as I mentioned in the video, um, you you can basically control these very similarly. So in this case here, we are passing in um, basically the the order first, and we're passing in the seasonal order, and then we are simply building the model, we're fitting the model, we're forecasting it, and we're, we're graphing the results. And an important thing to note is, um, you know, this is allowing us to kind of pick up on the seasonal and then this, or the multiplicative nature, and the spikes are increasing over time. The SREMA doesn't necessarily allow us to do it as easily, so it's kind of predicting the same peaks over time. So, you know, ultimately, which forecast is best is going to depend on trying a variety of, of formulas and seeing which has, you know, the lower error. And that's something that you can definitely explore and try on your own. Um, so next, I'm going to be talking about a more complex case for 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 forecasting. Um, this is made possible by an open source library called Profit, which was developed by Facebook. Um, under the hood, this is essentially fitting a, a, a model that's more of a fitted model, so a regression model for the data points. And as I mentioned earlier, it's basically a sum of the trend, holiday components, and then seasonality. So there's three things going into this model. And a lot of the benefits of this is that it's, it's abstracted away by an API, so you don't exactly need to understand the formula as well, because you can have these nice API endpoints you can interact with and you can build out pretty complex and, and detailed uh, formulas with. So um, one thing to note is that Profit requires the data to be formatted in a certain way. Um, in, instead of the date being like the index here, the date needs to be a column of a data frame called DS and then the quantity that you're forecasting on needs to be another column with the title Y here. Um, that's what I'm setting up here. Um, similarly, like the other models, you you shape the model, you can fit on it, and then you need to call this function here, which is pretty much listing out the data, the points in time or the, the points that you want to create forecasts for. So what I'm saying here is, you know, for 52 periods in the future, so in a, for a year worth, I want to create forecasts for these points. So it's basically making a data frame of, of all these weeks. And then I'm gonna take this data frame of these weeks and then pass it into this model.predict function. And then it's gonna basically build a forecast for me. So now we have, Basically, we have these dates now with the forecast, which is y hat. And this, this is the forecast for that week, and so on. 
And then we have these, which are 80% confidence intervals around Y hat. So um, it's pretty easy. As you saw here in a few lines, we were able to build a very, uh, a pretty complex model. And it also is great because we didn't have to worry about all the parameters, we, right? We didn't have these uh, alphas, betas, gammas, and these like these you know, P, D, and Q. So it allows us to make pretty powerful models without doing a lot of uh, fine tuning. And it's the intention here with Profit is that people who don't have a, a strong statistical background can go ahead and build pretty good models. All right, so at, as you know, it's a full blown API. So we can just do m.plot and then we can do the forecast and we can get this nice, beautiful graph here. As I mentioned earlier, there are some really cool um, basic API things you can do with Profit. One of them is to add holidays. So as you notice here, we missed the holidays here. Um, these are not just random outliers. They're actually the fourth of July, I mean, the uh, Super Bowl. So families tend to buy avocados for the Super Bowl, it seems like. And the model is first missing out on those because it doesn't know and thinks these are outliers. Well, luckily, um, Profit allows us to add holiday effects. So we can basically go in and we can um, build this data frame, which is basically the, the holiday, the date, and then the um, lower upper window. Um, that's where we're building up here. Uh, the lower window is basically saying that you know, it's this week, is the week of the Super Bowl, but we would expect that that week and also um, the week right before, we might expect some type of change in the trend because the Super Bowl is causing people to buy more avocados. So the negative one is just specifying that it's the week that the event happened and then the week before. And if it was a daily data set, it would be the day the week happens and the negative one would specify the day before. So this has allowed us to basically build some nuances to the model that typically we aren't able to capture. And the interesting thing is the Super Bowl is a floating holiday, so it's not you know the same um, same exact you know, day every week or same exact same exact week every every single year. So it allows us to basically have some flexibility. Actually, it might be the same week, but it's not the same day. So it might fall in you know, a slightly different point in time every year. So it allows us to capture these nuances that may not necessarily be present in the model all the time with the other types of seasonal models. So as you can see here, I'm basically setting up this data frame here. Then I'm going to basically simply pass it in as, as part of the, the constructor to profit the profit model here. And now if I do the same series of steps here, I can plot the forecast. And you can see here that it's peaking. Um, the forecast is now capturing this peak that happened in the beginning of the year on the Super Bowl. So we've effectively turned this point that it thought was an outlier into an actual point that we can forecast and predict for, which is pretty cool. Um, next, we're going to talk about seasonality and multi, uh, multi trends. So this, the trend was kind of constant. There's other cases where the trend changes over time. And Something great is profit allows can pick up on that naturally. And another thing I'm going to show in this is that there is actually holidays we can add. So we added custom holidays, which were the Super Bowl in the last example. We can actually add all of US holidays at once. So in this data set here, I am forecasting vehicle thefts. And um, we, we would expect there might be some changes. You know, we might see less or more vehicle thefts on certain holidays. So what I could do is um, I'm adding all these holidays to the model. So it's very easy. I just do uh, the model here and then model add country holidays, and then I'm adding all the US holidays here. And then what I do is um, I'm forecasting, I'm building the model and plotting it, and then we can see the shape here. And what's happening is the holidays are actually these like little points out here. So these little kind of little blue lines that stick out, so they're basically nuancing the model and saying that, you know, because of these holidays, we would expect slight changes. And one of the cool things about profits, we can actually break this down, right? It's very, very, well, it's daily, so there's a lot of data and it gets very clustered here. But if I want to split this apart into components to understand it, I can do that very easily. So I'm applying the trend here. This is the trend over time. And then I'm also applying, I can plot the holiday component, which is these peaks here. So when the holiday comes, it might increase with crime or might be negatively correlated with crime. And you see that represented by these like this, this uh, very pointy function here. Um, there's also weekly. So under the hood, we would expect that you know the weekly, it, they have this weekly, there's this weekly seasonality, and then this is a component that's going into the model, and then also, of course, the yearly seasonality as well. And the idea is that all of these four components here are what's being combined to build this forecast. So it's a pretty interesting model, and it's pretty creative how it does it. And of course, there's more resources here to learn about that. This brings us to the end of our um, time series module. Um, there's a variety of different methods to forecast time series, and of course, there's more than what I discussed in this module itself, but it's a great starting point. And if you're interested in learning more, I really recommend you go to the um, resources slash additional, additional reading uh, at the bottom of each of these models here to fully understand and maybe find ways you can find a, um, further fine tune them to your specific needs. Thank you.